Welcome to Learning with Lisa, Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast with Lisa Navarra, award-winning educator, consultant, behavior specialist, author, and parent. Welcome to Student Success Beyond Expectations. Are you a parent of a child or children who have an, an invisible disability? You know, one of those disabilities that have a large impact on the family structure as well as the child's whole being, and no one really can see what that disability is just by looking. And so that makes you hesitant to go out in public. But not only does it make you hesitant to go out in public because your child might have a sensory meltdown or have a tantrum, and it doesn't really seem to fit the way the child, quote unquote, looks compared to the severity of the tantrum or the behavior that might be seen. But what about when you wanna travel with your child who has an invisible disability? What's your first approach? Where do you go for information? And how do you find the best ways to make a vacation a fun vacation? Well, Dawn Barkley is here with us today and she wrote the book, Traveling Different. And she'll go into that title a bit more than I just did. But she's here to really tell you about certain strategies and some of her top suggestions of really how to make your vacation fun. So welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your book. Okay. So the full name, I know it's a mouthful, is Traveling Different Vacation Strategies for Parents of the Anxious, the Inflexible, and the Neurodiverse. Uh, It's uh, about 344 pages filled with interviews from over 100 people. Uh, that are either parents, uh, mental health professionals, allies, advocates, and certified autism travel professionals who have specialized in helping those uh, on the spectrum travel, and most of whom are special needs parents themselves. So you really have been able to take the community and add it into your book and really provide a diverse amount of suggestions and strategies based on experiences and knowledge. I I saw it as a crowdsourcing opportunity because all of us together have more information than one of us. So uh, I was able to get a lot of different perspectives on uh, various issues. You'll see uh, more than one suggestion for handling different aspects of travel. And the parents were exceptionally generous in talking about what they did wrong and what they learned from it and and how they corrected it. So you can learn from their mistakes as well. What were some of the really poignant type of lessons that some parents have learned? A lot of parents realize that they have to pace the trip to the child's abilities rather than mm-hmm. what they used to do when uh, before they had children. And they learn that the hard way by walking through Disney with a nine-year-old sleeping on their back or a child falling asleep at lunch. <laughs> And they learn quickly that it was smart to spend the afternoon decompressing by the pool or in front of the TV and, you know, maybe take on one uh, tour a day or or one activity a day. And one father um, discovered the hard way that uh, they don't serve ice cream at Disney at 9 a.m. And his child had wasn't really very understanding about that. And he was smart. He called his certified autism travel professional who told him over the phone where to go in the park where it was quieter, less people, the child could decompress and uh, they could, you know, he, they could calm down until ice cream did open up at 10 a.m. So I like that. It's kind of like an SOS to the mainland, this uh, certified autism travel professional. Yes. So where would someone even be able to find a professional and support such as that person? Yeah, there is a a website run by a group called IBCCES who does a lot of credentialing in the autism world. IBCCES stands for the International Board of Credentialing and uh, and Continuing Education Standards. Uh, And they run autismtravel.com. And if you go there and you click on travel agents, you can uh, search by location. Even though if you like some of the things that the people in the book indicated, because I interviewed so many of them, you can work with them nowhere, no matter where you're located because Zoom works everywhere. Right, right. Yeah. 
So tell us about some of your top strategies to help make a vacation a fun vacation. Well, the first thing is to remember that you never spring a vacation on a child, whether they're neurotypical or neurodiverse. You just never do that. You don't wake up and say, hey, we're going to Disney today or wherever you're going. Uh, it requires a lot of preparation because you have to remember that children crave predictability and routine and travel is anything but. So the idea is to find ways to make the trip as predictable as possible. So first thing is to introduce the child to the concept of travel. And you can do that in many ways. You can find picture books with the child's favorite character in travel situations. And I list a number of them in the book, but you can just go and speak to your local librarian and they can suggest far more. Uh, you can look at uh, videos. Thank goodness in the age of video, you can see every aspect of a trip ahead of time, either through YouTube or from the supplier. I had one uh, set of parents who would preview every aspect of a theme park, every ride ahead of time to decide what they were going to rule out. And this sounds like a good strategy to me. Um, you can do role play. I spoke to one special needs um, educator who had a, um, a student who was about to go on his first plane ride. He had never been on a plane before. They set the classroom up as an airplane. They took turns announcing into a microphone what the pilot might say. Uh, they took turns being the flight attendant and they learned things like why not to kick the seat in front of you? Why not to keep playing with the call button? So these are valuable things that you can role play at home. So you introduce that way. You can also write social stories. And if your audience doesn't know social stories, they should look up books by Carol Gray, who's a, a very well-known autism consultant. She can describe it far better than me. Uh, and then I also advocate um, mini experiences. So what I mean by that is that instead of spending thousands on a hotel before your child has ever spent a night away from home, perhaps you go one night to a local hotel or you stay at a friend or relative's house. And so you can experience with the child what it's like to sleep in a bed other than their own. Mm, you're really gonna nice. see, yeah, you're going to see the triggers right away. You're going to see right. whether the child needs a nightlight or needs right. a fan to drown out noise from the hallway or needs the sheets and blankets that have the familiar texture and scent of home. So you can also sample the airport through a group called uh, the ARCS uh, Wings for Autism program. Uh, they're in about 70 airports around the country and they can give you a dress rehearsal of the airport from arrival to boarding. Uh, and a number of airlines will do that for you too outside of that program. Even it's, it can be as simple as just setting up um, a tent outside before a big camping trip. Just try things on a small scale first. That's really great advice. It's, you know, it takes a little bit of a, a level of creativity to find ways to simulate what it is that you're going to be doing in the future. Yeah. Yeah. But it's important to sit down and prepare. So that's the next tip is that you should really think through the trip from beginning to end every single aspect of the trip. So for example, if you're flying into a city and your hotel provides a free jitney to the hotel, um, if you have a child who doesn't like crowds, doesn't like strange smells, you perhaps don't want to take that jitney. Perhaps you want to get an Uber or rent a car so that you have more control of your situation. So it's a matter of just thinking things through and also creating a child-centric vacation. And that is more than just the pacing that I described before. It can also be um, thinking about having the child have a say in the vacation. So maybe vetting three different destinations with a certified autism travel professional. And then all those are approved by you and your significant other. Let the child decide the ultimate destination and also the things you do during the day. Uh, same thing, pre-vet them first so there's no wrong answer because now your child has a vested interest in the success of the trip. Let them help in the packing and picking what they're going to bring. And um, if they have special interests, as so many children on the spectrum do, why not build the vacation around that special interest by including mm -hmm. special needs museums, uh, not special needs, special interest museums that will feed into that passion. Sure. See what's available. Yeah. yeah. So I include a very long chapter on special interests and all the places that you can feed into them around the country. 
How big is this book of yours? It sounds like it yeah. has a lot of information in yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's 344 pages. Wow. It's a lot of work to put together. That's good. Yes. Yeah. I'm very I try to be very comprehensive. Yes. Yeah, I liked the fact that you were able to really solicit the information from a lot of people of some experience and knowledge based on what the topic is that you're talking about. And I also like the fact that you identify it as invisible disabilities because it's something where people really need to become more sensitive of, in my own opinion, just because they, they're, I think that they're really not aware of how these disabilities really have such an influence over children and families' lives, right? It's so true. And that's one of the reasons that many families don't travel is because they're afraid that people will judge them if their child has a meltdown. They'll judge them as bad parents and the child is a brat when really it's just the child is overwhelmed by all the sensations and all the input that are coming into their senses all at once that are unfamiliar. Right. And before we started recording, you did mention a statistics of 78% of parents would you like to continue? Yep, seventy-eight percent of parents uh, that were interviewed by um, IBCCES in a survey of a thousand special needs parents said they won't travel, but that was um, better than it had been back in um, 2018 when that number was 87 percent. And one of the reasons, uh, 90, I should say, 93 percent of the people who said they wouldn't travel said they would consider it if they knew where to go, what to do, and right. knew where people would be more attuned to what they need. Right. Um, hence the book, which I would hope would help them with that because it is a checklist of what to consider and where to go. It's about 75% strategies right. as opposed to just destinations, but it does include all of the places that are either certified autism centers, which means they've been trained by IBCCES and credentialed by them or autism friendly, which can be from a number of different groups or it can just be that they call themselves autism friendly, which means you really have to do your due diligence and call those places and ask what they mean by the fact that they're autism friendly and what they offer and decide if it's right for your child. And also if what they offer is being offered when you're there, because there are some museums that might have a low sensory afternoon one Saturday a month. That's not going to help you if you're not there that Saturday. Right. Absolutely. So talk to us again a little bit more about um, some common mistakes. I think that's really helpful for the listeners to hear. So that way they could say, oh, you know, that's something I didn't think about yet. So we want to talk about things maybe parents haven't really thought about or they might, something that might slip through the cracks for them. Yeah. So you know your child. So um, the most important thing is to consider your child and how they're going to react as you plan this vacation from E to Z. Uh, always bring your go-to bag. And I list it in every chapter. So if people think I'm being redundant, it's just that I think people are going to read whatever chapters apply to their particular ah, trip. Yeah. So go-to bag can have everything but uh, like favorite snacks, um, a uh, noise canceling headphones always, dark glasses if you're going someplace where there's going to be bright lights. Also theme parks at night, bring your dark glasses. Uh, because that can be very disturbing, all those bright lights. Um, fidget toys, uh, electronics filled with your favorite movies and, and television shows, anything that's going to keep the child occupied. I recommend a change of clothing as well, especially for the mom, because I have been vomited on, on in flight. <laughs> I know uh. how disturbing that is, but also for the child uh, to bring a change of clothing for them. So the, the bag is listed in every chapter. And I, then I think everything else is, is really dependent on where you're going and how you're getting there, which is how I broke the book down. Um, so for, do you need to bring a lot with you? The child needs a lot of things. You may consider either car travel, which puts you in control because you decide where you're going to stop and, and what you're going to do and what the pace is or train travel because Amtrak is very liberal. Um, very liberal baggage allowances and also by taking the train it gives you more chance to focus on the child instead of the road but say you are going on a road trip you know you want to scope that out in advance and figure out where you're going to stop if your child is going to have a lot of pent-up energy you're going to want to stop find where the playgrounds are where the parks are en route you may want to drive when the child is normally sleeping 
but you certainly don't want to have a child stuck in traffic um, and being wired and, uh, you know, rush hour, you may want to skip rush hour and just decide you're going to be at a park during that time. So it's a matter of really being focused on whatever it is you're planning to do. And that's where the tips lie. So I'd say the biggest mistakes are not preparing enough, not viewing things on video, uh, not realizing that you can always check in for a flight with one parent checking in, the other staying with the child in the stroller or for a, a hotel. Now you have, um, you have digital check-in at some hotels so that you can do it all with your phone. You can also, I always recommend also um, staying at a hotel with a kitchen or kitchenette so you can plan the child's uh, meals, especially if you have a finicky child. There is a long chapter on restaurant dining. Ah, which, restaurant which, dining. Yeah, that was one of my issues with just having the screaming in restaurants. Um, but talking about ways to get around the problems in restaurants, for example, bringing a... Uh, a stopwatch or a digital clock that works on battery and showing the child like in 10 minutes, we're going to go for a walk and then we'll come back uh, so that, you know, you're not waiting endlessly for the food, which you, you sometimes are, at least you're breaking up the time and the child can see what, you know, how much time is till they can go outside and take a walk. And uh, there's an end to the wait. So there's a lot of things like that, ordering ahead of time at the restaurant. So the, some food is waiting for the child when they get there, eating ahead of time. So the child isn't starving when they get to the restaurant and maybe just having the child eat dessert while you're eating your main course. Tips like that. Mm -hmm. Really great tips. Dawn, is there anything else that you feel like parents need to know before we leave? I think they need to know um, that if they check out my blog, which is at travelingdifferent.com, they are going to um, have access to my blog. And the blog has a lot of information that either updates or supplements the book. For example, I have a whole story on how to um, handle the come down after the trip. Like when the child mm. has to come down from the high of vacationing, which would have been a great final chapter if I thought about it before the book went to print. Uh, but there's also a whole chapter on a, a company called Becoming um becoming rentable which is a um a company that i found out about after the the book went to print um that that's vacation rentals and i also if you're not going to stay at a hotel with a kitchenette get a vacation rental but a lot of them are self reporting which means that they might say that they're handicapped you know wheelchair accessible or that they are uh good for kids with autism when really no one's really checked it out well the people at becoming rentable do check those things out. And so um, that is a very good resource to find even a hotel that will, uh, or a vacation rental that'll cater to uh, people with vision and hearing um, problems, as well as wheelchair, needing a wheelchair accessibility or being on the spectrum. Parents, you can hear all of these suggestions that we are discussing with you today. We hope that this has been helpful from the bag of go-to bag of, of everything that your child might want or co that comforts him or her to really even ordering ahead at the restaurant. So there's a wide range of strategies and information here for you to explore. So thank you very much, Dawn. We're going to add in your information in the description so parents are able to follow through and find out some more information that can help them to make sure that their vacation remains a fun vacation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to the Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast, where school leaders, educators, and parents meet on behalf of children who struggle with learning.